Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm long overdue for a video. It's been a very, very busy uh, summer so far. And uh, behind me, you can see uh, Lac Limi, and uh, there's a big water fountain in the center there. And of course, it's a very dark and ominous sky. So that, um, that sets the tone for this video and my discussions because of course I'll be talking about abrupt climate system change and uh, I'll just pan around slowly here there's a little marina and this is uh, Casino Lac Limi so this is very pertinent because we're all in the climate casino right now and many many cities many many places are being affected strongly um, in an adverse uh, manner by abrupt climate system change, whether it be wildfires or torrential rains leading to flooding or droughts, withering crops or what have you. Okay, so uh, I mean the climate casino is a very apt uh, description because no place in the world is exempt or immune or um, isolated from abrupt climate system change. We're all in this on the planet. Many, many places are being affected unequally. Some are being hit hard repeatedly, where others are having less adverse conditions. But we're heading to a world where we have global food shortages leading to famine. And of course, this will affect every single person on the planet. So the report, uh, Working Group 1, by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just came out, of course. And I'll make a few comments about that now, but it's a 3,497-page uh, uh, document, plus there's uh, 30 or 40 pages for summary for policymakers. And of course, this document is very timely because the uh, COP26 climate conference is coming on in, uh, in a couple months in Glasgow, Scotland. And um, I'm really hopeful that um, the conference will be open for people and I'll be attending, giving uh, press conference presentations daily with Peter Carter and Regina. Um, and uh, they'll be uploaded to the, um, to the UN website daily. I'll be doing, I'm also working with, so I'm working with a number of different groups. I'm working with uh, Facing Future, which is uh, ably run, um, or, you know, I think of it as being run by uh, Charles, my friends uh, in Ottawa, Charles and Heidi. Um, I'm doing Climate Emergency Forum videos every week. So Google Climate Emergency Forum and check out these videos. This is with Peter Carter and Regina and myself, um, ably directed by Heidi and Charles. Um, and I'm also doing, just last week, I had a great interview with my good friend Alex Smith with EcoShock Radio. So you can just Google EcoShock Radio and have that look at that link of our hour-long interview. Um, I'm also doing, I'm in a monthly video with uh, Peter Wadhams um, being interviewed by Meta Spencer. Often there are other people on the show. We're going to do one soon on, uh, we did one recently on um, ocean uh, plankton. The idea of using uh, stimulating phytoplankton blooms to capture carbon and we're doing another one soon um, I believe with Peter Ward and a few other people um, in a few weeks it should be we'll, we'll film it and it'll be uploaded to YouTube videos check out Meta Spencer M-E-T-T-A S-P-E-N-C-E-R um, check out her um, she's interviewing loads of people sometimes she does five interviews a week and it's all posted on on her website, um, so make sure you check out that. There's lots of different groups that are doing some great stuff, including Scientist Warning and others. So I'm always uh, keeping busy. Um, I had a little, um, you know, lapse with my website as I've done some uh, 
summer adventures. Um, the latest was uh, scuba diving with my son, Neil. We took an advanced uh, adventurer course. It's an advanced open water diving course. Um, I did it through the local diving outfit. And this was just last weekend. And for this uh, course, we, we did five dives. First one was on a wreck called the, the, the first one was a drift dive um, in a canal um, just off, just down at the St. Lawrence River, just off the, off the river was this canal. And uh, so, you know, very, very strong currents in the canal, not too deep. So we did the drift dive, we parked the cars, brought the equipment, dropped it off at a site up, up canal and uh, left the cars near the Conestoga wreck, which is the area where we got out of the water and uh, got lifts up to the equipment and we entered the water and it was a very, very strong current taking us most of the way. And uh, for some reason, my, uh, you know, my weight belt, it was tough for me to get it tight enough. And, uh, you know, I thought it was okay. And then the buckle came undone as I was diving and, uh, you know, the weights sort of fell below. One of the weights on the belt fell off. But, you know, I managed to grab the belt and hold on to it and uh, tried to sort that out. And that was a bit of an adventure and a bit of fun. Finally, um, you know, got the missing weights and continued on with the dive. But that's always fun because your buoyancy gets, gets really screwed up and you, you struggle to stay down if you, if you, if you lose your weights, obviously. Um, and then my flipper came off, but a diver below got that. So it was all, all kinds of excitement. Um, at, at, at my expense. Um, and uh, anyway, when we got to, when we ended that dive, so I continued the dive just holding onto my weights. And as we ended that dive, um, we came, surfaced, and there was a tremendous, um, tremendously intense thunderstorm going on directly over our heads. There was torrential rains, there was lightning and thunder all around us. In fact, it was so close we could just see, we could just see flashes and uh, very, very loud. So, you know, we have two choices as divers. We're, we're relatively safe under the water. Um, in fact, uh, there's, you know, doing a little bit of research after the fact on are you safe under the water during a lightning storm. Um, this diving party was about 15, 20 feet down and lightning struck about 100 feet away as observed from a boat where they were diving from and they felt like uh, they were okay they felt like they were punched simultaneously at all from all directions over their entire body so it was like a shock wave in the water which uh, passed them no electrical um, no no electrical problem the charge gets dissipated all over but you're you're relatively safe under the water it's at the top of the water you have to worry because you're carrying a metal tank you know aluminum tank and uh, you know some divers have been killed on the surface of the water by lightning strikes i haven't heard of any under the water uh, anyway so we surfaced near the shore and we scrambled out as quickly as possible during the lightning storm and got safely on shore so that was a bit of an unexpected um, uh, adventure if you like um, you know that's probably the riskiest part i'm sure that was the riskiest part of the of the whole dive uh, then we dove on the wreck, the Conestoga, and uh, then the next dive was a night dive. So we entered the water just as it was getting dark on another d dive site for the Ross Say, third dive of the day. And, uh, you know, it was pitch black in the water. Of course, you have flashlights, you go along the bottom. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was uh, quite an adventure, you know, being pitch black. At one point, we shut off our flashlights, and it's basically pitch, pitch black. Um, and uh, it, uh, so we had a dive on the Rasse uh, uh, ship for the night dive and then went home and recharged the tanks and then the next day we went, so this is all in the St. Lawrence River, and then the next day we went into Quebec and uh, to a quarry, Morrison's quarry, and we did a dive to, um, a buoyancy dive to learn all the techniques of controlling your buoyancy. And it's actually quite interesting because you reach neutral buoyancy with your, you're wearing a wetsuit and you're wearing the weight belt. So you have neutral buoyancy. But of course, as you change depth, 
you don't no longer have neutral buoyancy because the wetsuit gets compressed, so you lose buoyancy on that, and the air in your the air in your lungs and everything uh, gets compressed, so you have less buoyancy from that as you go deeper. And also uh, throughout the dive, as you're using up air from your tank, your tank gets lighter. Okay, so your buoyancy is always always needs to be adjusted at all parts of the dive, and we uh, practiced adjusting it so that basically you'd be neutral buoyancy, you're not going up or down um, in the middle of your breath. When you take a deep breath, of course, air fills your lungs and you start going up. When you exhale, a long exhale as much as you can, then you start to sink. So just by controlling the, the uh, depth of your breathing, you can control the uh, buoyancy, you know, fine tune control the buoyancy. So that was very interesting. And then we did a deep dive, we dove down to, uh, so there, there was a plane on the quarry that we dove around and there was a submarine uh, on the bottom and things like that. So it's in, there's a lot of interesting things to see uh, as a diver. So we did that. And then we did, the last dive was a deep dive. We went down to um, about 25 meters, uh, which is, uh, was 82 and a half feet. Um, and uh, pretty dark down there, we had the flashlights on and the water was quite uh, chilly, uh, four degrees uh, Celsius, so slightly above zero. And uh, if you've been paying attention to uh, my videos from a long time ago, I did do a whole video on sort of, bu you know, buoyancy of water. And the, the, the interesting thing about fresh water is, is the highest density, uh, the, of course, when you cool things down, right, they get heavier. We know that hot water, hotter water, warmer water floats on the top. And uh, so um, as you go down, um, the water temperature decreases and decreases because the water gets denser and denser as it gets colder, down to a temperature of four degrees Celsius. And then something magical happens because of hydrogen bonding in the, between the water molecules and as you go below four degrees Celsius, the density actually drops and decreases. Okay, so, uh, you know, decreases down, and this is why, you know, at zero, the, the lighter water then freezes and the, wa the ice floats on top of the water. So basically, uh, you know, freshwater lakes have an overturning twice a year if they're relatively shallow, the, right, and there, the temperature is four degrees all the way through the water column because when the water reaches four, it sinks to the bottom. So it's cooled at the top by the colder air, it sinks down and you get a whole lake, you get the entire lake becomes four degrees Celsius. This uh, water going down brings oxygen with it, which is very important for the ecosystem of the lake. And it also brings uh, CO2 down uh, because the colder the water, the more uh, gas it can dissolve, right? Water is unique in, the, or it's an interesting property of water with gases Gases dissolve more readily in colder water. That's opposite to solid. So things like salt and stuff, they'll dissolve more in uh, warmer water than they will in colder water. So it's an opposite effect between solids and, and uh, gases. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to, getting back to the climate document, okay? Um, you know, obviously all hell is breaking loose on the planet with the extreme temperature, extreme heating, various places on the planet, um, all the wildfires. I mean, Canada is full of boreal forests. You know, what's going to happen when, when the temperature is a few degrees higher? You know, instead of just uh, a, a small fraction of a percent of Canada's forest burning, imagine 10 percent or 20 or 50 percent of the, of, the, of the forests in Canada burning and in other countries, the northern boreal forests. I mean, this is what we're risking as we move forward with abrupt climate change. We're going to basically scorch all the vegetation on the surface of the earth and that's going to of course greatly increase the load of carbon in the atmosphere and it's also going to wipe out the plant, uh, the vegetation sink. So I bought this, I, I, I read loads of books and there's a book by Carl Sagan where he's discussing uh, the, the nuclear winter effect and uh, the effect of all of these aerosols in the atmosphere. And I'll be uh, you know, talking about that more 
but uh, I can say I told you so. I'm going to go into detailed videos on components of the report. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.